wrote almost 40 years ago called Celebration of Discipline with these words in chapter one, superficiality is the curse of our age. Superficiality is the curse of our age. In this three week series, maybe four week, I want us to think about ways of moving beyond the superficial, the superficial, if you will, into the greater depths of God, or in this case, what we're calling it is stepping up into something more. Imagine hearing a knock at your door, a hard knock, and you open up the door and there stands a squad of soldiers fully armed, and they tell you you have 15 minutes to pack anything that you want and to leave to flee the country. What would you pack? 15 minutes. You have to pack anything that you consider valuable, and you'll never see your house again. All those pictures on the walls, the family portraits, you'll never see them again. You've got to go in 15 minutes. What would you pack? Maybe a cell phone, charger, medical supplies, food. What would you think of? How much time would you spend just panicking over 15 minutes? I've got to pack anything that I need in order to leave. Where's my suitcase? Where's the backpacks? Well, that really happened to someone I know. In fact, the, one of the lecturers at the academy last week is from Vietnam. He said in 1954, his family moved from North Vietnam to South Vietnam. And in 1975, as everything was collapsing, they were told, you have 15 minutes to get all the possessions you need. We're fleeing the country. Now imagine that. A knock at your door that totally changes everything, telling you you have 15 minutes to pack what you need, and you're fleeing the country. Now, he was just a teenager at the time. And he said while they were in the crowds of people, he got separated from his family. Imagine that. I mean, you're, you're fleeing anyway, and then you get separated from your family. And he said all he had was his suitcase filled with, with what it, they thought he needed. And he was standing there, and he got separated from his family. And so he's awaiting, and there's an open gate. And slowly people are going through. And he put his suitcase down, and he's just looking around. He's looking for his family. And so he drifts a little from his suitcase, and suddenly the gate starts to close rapidly. And anyone on this side of the gate stays in South Vietnam, and anyone who gets through the gate gets to flee to freedom. He said he had a decision to make. Do I go back and grab my suitcase and have that stuff but be here, or do I walk away from my suitcase and squeeze through the closing gate? in order to walk into freedom. He left his suitcase behind in order to be free. And he made it to this country, and today he's a professor at a university. I guess they call that the American dream. But there he was, one of my lecturers, telling us this riveting story of what happened in his life. It makes me wonder, what's in our suitcases that we hold on to, that keep us from walking through the gate into real freedom, into real growth? What are the things, what's the stuff that we so value that it holds us in its grip, that keeps us from leaving it behind and walking in something much more powerful, the depths of the Holy Spirit? What are the things that we need to offer to God for full transformation in our lives to happen. And why is transformation so important? Why is it so important to give God stuff, to unpack our lives, to be accountable in order for transformation to happen? Why is that necessary? Well, this next slide, it's an idea that I really got in reading some of the writings of Father Richard Rohr. And so this is a variation of something he said. What isn't transformed is transmitted. What isn't transformed is transmitted. Maybe in our suitcase we're filled with fear. 
And if that fear isn't brought to the foot of the cross and, and given to Jesus and transformation allowed to happen, then that which is not transformed is transmitted either to others or inwardly to ourselves. Show me someone who is gripped in fear and anxiety, angst, and who is not being transformed in that area, and I will show you someone who is transmitting fear and angst to family, to others, to colleagues, to themselves. Show me someone who is filled with anger. Their suitcase is filled with anger, and they've not given that over to be transformed by Jesus. Our Gabby Oliver gave this beautiful message. I listened to it uh, on, on the YouTube the other day. Beautiful message on her life and the work that Jesus is doing in her. And she said something I thought was really, really insightful. That even though Jesus had done a work and brought healing into her life, she was still carrying with her issues of anger from the past that she had to let go. Is anger in the suitcase that's keeping you from walking through the gate of freedom. Gabby gave that over in order for Jesus to transform it. But show me someone who is filled with anger, who is not giving that anger to Jesus to be transformed, and I will show you someone who is transmitting anger to their family, to their colleagues, to people around them, or they're transmitting it inwardly to self-abusive things in their own life. Negativity. You ever known someone that has a suitcase filled with negativity? And it's just like poison. My mom used to call negativity poison. In fact, in our family, when we would start talking negatively, she would quell that, and she would say that releases poison into your system. And it really is a poison. And show me someone who is negative, who is not giving that negativity over to Jesus to be transformed into hope. And I'll show you someone who is transmitting negativity. Peace. Show me someone who is always in a panic, always hurried, always excessively busy, and there's no sense of Jesus calm in their lives. And I'll show you someone who's transmitting chaos and panic to people around them. Or they're internalizing it and they're destroying themselves on the inside. And then there's grief, something that many of us are acquainted with in recent times, but grief and, and suffering. And, and Richard Rohr, actually the context of his words have to do with pain and suffering. And what we do with that. And if suffering and pain become something that continues to just lie dormant, and we never deal with it, and we don't, don't let Jesus turn that into trust and wholeness and healing to where we can actually be used to bring hope to others, then it festers and it begins to transmit in our lives despair and aloneness from God. A, a woman a number of years ago visited our seminary in Dubuque and her daughter had been murdered. And she talked about the downward spiral that that sent her into as a result and the hopelessness and the despair and the darkness and the anger that she felt to God for this to be allowed to happen. And what she didn't realize is the months and months and months that she held this festering in her soul, she was transmitting that to the rest of her family. And her own remaining children became the recipients of this dark, blanket of despair and anger and hopelessness and gray rather than the healing hues of God in the midst of their family. And then she said the day came when out of the pit God reached down by his incredible hand of light and love and began pulling me out and something amazing happened as she became transformed by God's love and was able to go to the young man who had murdered her daughter and forgive him, something happened because she began to transmit forgiveness and love and hope and light to her family. What isn't transformed 
is transmitted. So let's receive hope from God's word on how we can do that. In this next slide, Hebrews chapter, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Would you read it with me, please? Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. I particularly would like you to focus on those words. First of all, a cloud of witnesses. Uh, witnesses is the same word as martyr. The idea is these are folks who are surrounding us who have paid a price, who are not superficial in their faith, but they are people who have stayed before God and paid with their lives and they become our witnesses. In fact, the author of Hebrews is sort of painting for us, it seems, a picture of the Greco-Roman games where the crowd surrounds the, the competitors, the athletes. Only in this case, the crowd is made up of those who have been athletes, who have proven themselves, who have died for the faith, and they become our arena of faithfulness that surrounds us, cheering us on, if you will allow me some license, as they view us, they surround us, they become the martyrs, the witnesses around us. And so the author of Hebrews says, since we have this cloud of witnesses, those who have been faithful, talked about in the previous chapter, the hall of faith in the 11th chapter, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, and for us in modern times, we can think about those faithful people, those Grandma Marians, those people who have walked with Jesus and who leave for us the ripple of their lives ever beating upon our heart in a godlike rhythm. We have those people, grandparents and dads and moms and uncles and aunts and friends who have gone on to be with Jesus who will forever be for us a cloud of witness because they kept the faith through thick and thin. And we receive that strength as we ponder their lives. As we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also, which implies they've done this, let us also do what they did in order to walk this way of, of, of Christian victory. Let us also lay aside every encumbrance, weight, uh, obstacle of distraction, and the sin which so easily entangles us, let us run with endurance, perseverance, the race, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Let us lay aside every encumbrance, every weight, every distraction, and the sin which so easily entangles us. The, the juxtaposition of those two things leads me to think that the sin that so easily entangles me comes out of that encumbrance, those distractions, those weights, those things that vie for my attention that I yield to then that becomes seedbed for the sin that I'm vulnerable to. <clears throat> How do we surrender that? Uh, Lorraine and I, back in the 90s, went to Ukraine on a mission trip. And uh, we took, this was just my stuff. I had this filled to overflowing, and I had this back, a backpack like this. And we Americans pack way, way too much. So there we are. And I even packed silverware in my bag. I must have thought the Ukrainians ate with their fingers. I don't know why I took silverware, but I was way overpacked. And in fact, just before I had left for this mission trip, I had done a load of laundry, and I had put a red shirt in with my underwear. So now I had pink underwear. And I don't know what possessed me to do this, but I thought a nice way of cradling, and this is, this is pre-9-11, so a little different today, but I thought a nice way of cradling the silverware set that I was taking was to wrap the silverware up in my underwear, my pink underwear, stuck it in the bag, way down deep. So as we're going through Ukrainian customs, 
they're looking at stuff and they detect metal in my bag. And they ask me to take that out of my bag. <sighs> so I dig through this bag and inside I'm just thinking, oh no. And I pull out this pink underwear and I unwrap my underwear to show them the silverware. And the look on that Ukrainian's face, I don't think I will ever forget. It was part disbelief, it was part he wanted to laugh, but he kept that stern Ukrainian face and basically just said, go on through. <laughs> when we got to Kiev, we spent a week ministering there on the streets and doing skits and preaching and singing. And then we were going to spend a week in Chernigov. And in Chernigov, the team leader said, you can't take all this stuff. You can only take one backpack for a week. This is where I learned that you can travel with just a backpack. And the rest of the time, that's how Lorraine and I have traveled to parts of Europe, Asia, Africa, and this backpack I got on a clearance at some sports store for five bucks. It just shows you. You don't have to have real fancy stuff, a $5 backpack. So I had to make some decisions about the stuff in my life. And I rather think that stepping up from superficiality involves some decisions. What's the stuff in my life that's weighting me down, that's keeping me from stepping up to something more significant and rich in my walk of faith? How do I grow beyond where I am that can sometimes become pretty superficial? I've got to make some decisions. And so I had to leave some pretty important things behind, like a hairdryer. Wow, back in those days, my hair was longer and uh, I was still suffering from the vanity of being a gospel singer for many, many years. And so a hairdryer for me was just something I brought. And I still use some hairspray today, but I used so much hairspray back in those days that on a windy day, I might lose a sideburn, if you know what I'm saying. And I had to make some decisions, some hair decisions about what to leave behind. So I left the hairdryer behind and I just had to let it dry. And so one thing at a time, I had to decide is this what I need, truly need to take for my journey as I go to Chernigov? And I was able to do it with just this backpack, leaving behind excessive stuff that I didn't need, go to Chernigov and minister on the streets and, and other places and churches. I got to preach in an underground church there and minister the gospel of Jesus with lots of stuff left behind. So what's the stuff that God may be dealing with you about in your life? The stuff that's sort of holding you at a superficial place, and yet you feel God calling you to move on to something deeper. What is it that God's asking you? What's the encumbrance in your life that so easily entangles you that God's whispering to you, maybe even now, it's time to let it go? You see... You can't take hold of what God has for you until you let go of what he's wanting you to leave behind. Just like the trapeze artist, you got to let go of one thing in order to turn and grab the best thing. So what's God asking you to let go of in order to grab a hold of? And then I love this part of the verse that says fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, that's the key. Keep your eyes on Jesus. This communion table that we're going to partake of now, it is representative of that. Jesus told us to do this in remembrance of him. And so I like to think of this communion table as, and I borrow from N.T. Wright a phrase that has become my own now, the intersection of heaven and earth. I love that saying. The intersection of heaven and earth. There are many of those, and this is one of them. When you come forward to receive communion, fixing your eyes on Jesus, think of it as the intersection between heaven and earth and Jesus. Holding the hands of the communion of saints around us, holding our hands and bringing us together as with our cloud of witnesses, 
We surrender those things in our lives that hold us in the grips of superficiality as we surrender them to Jesus and we step up to transformation and a greater depth in our Christian life. In the same night that Jesus would give himself, he took the bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it saying, this is my body given for you. Eat this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this is my blood of the new covenant shed for the sins of the world. Drink this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Would you pray with me, please? We are honored and privileged and delighted to consecrate these elements now, this bread, the body of Christ, this cup, the blood of Christ. We fix our eyes upon Jesus. We receive forgiveness and cleansing. And Jesus, as we come before you, we examine our hearts and we surrender those things in our lives the stuff that you're asking us to let go in order to take hold of the abundant blessings that you offer us. We give you thanks for this table of grace in Christ's name. Amen. As our stewards come forward, please.